it's a pleasure. It's actually a triple pleasure, I have to say, to be invited to uh, Sarajevo Arbitration Days um, for many reasons, uh, including person, professional, otherwise. I would have loved to be there in person. So I'm very grateful for the invitation and for the excellent team that have put together this event with stellar speakers. Uh, the second uh, sort of uh, thrill that I have is listening to Lucy's uh, excellent keynote. Um, and the third one is looking forward to all the stellar panelists who are going to give excellent presentations, I'm sure. Um, let me say that the idea behind this um, presentation that I'm going to make, um, as discussed originally with Fahira, we wanted to start with a positive note, a positive look. Uh, there is so much frustration, uh, devastation, negative uh, feelings and views about the situation in COVID-19. In fact, statistics and studies across the globe um, seem to have indicated that people across the globe think that 2020 has been the most stressful year in their lives. Um, I surely hope that no more years would be as stressful and hopefully would be more uh, uh, of a blessing and a happy note to start. Um, my topic today focuses on prospects and opportunities with more of a positive, I think, outlook and optimism, hopefully. Um, that said, I thought how best to structure uh, my presentation in this regard and say something new that I have not said uh, 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 in other webinars, which I, I, I try my best not to repeat ever myself in, in any webinar. So I would say that when we talk about prospects and opportunities for international arbitration, amidst the COVID-19 uh, situation or crisis, as it called, uh, I think it has affected us, COVID-19, uh, in three different areas in our community. The process itself, which is the transformative role COVID-19 has had as a catalyst of change on the arbitration process, which is, by the way, still ongoing. It is by no, it, by no means has it ended, nor will it very soon. It is just the first chapter of a book of change regarding the process. The most visible and immediate aspect of it, an impact has been on the virtual hearing side. And I do not intend to address that in this presentation. So the process, you're all aware, you're all familiar of the undergoing change, the discussions over remote and virtual hearings and otherwise. So that will not be my focus. The second aspect is the service. Uh, so apart from the process, the services that we have uh, uh, seen emerging in relation to the COVID-19 crisis. So we see more sophistication in relation to e-platforms uh, for, again, hearings or otherwise, document management systems, legal support tools emerging, trainings on these virtual hearings and advocacy in uh, an online environment, team collaboration tools and otherwise. So a whole new array of support services have emerged and are increasing uh, where companies and others are more or less catering for what people have labeled the new norma, normal in a way. Uh, obviously, this will have its impact on the costs element uh, in arbitrations because we will see now new line of items in cost submissions because of the situation we are facing. So I don't intend to dwell much on this either. My concern and focus for the next uh, uh, few minutes actually that I have will be on the players. Uh, so we've got the process, the services and the players. Uh, and what new opportunities and prospects the players have. Now looking at the players, I've grouped them into six categories. Um, arbitrators, council, tribunal secretaries, institutions, experts, and believe it or not, artificial intelligence, because that is a player currently perhaps in the shadows, but very soon could be at the very forefront of it. Uh, my focus again will be on the human element rather than artificial intelligence. So I don't intend to spend time on this, but the infusion and the interaction between the human intelligence and the type of artificial intelligence may feature uh, throughout my uh, uh, presentation now. Now, looking at these players, and primarily, again, on the human side, the individuals, uh, 
the arbitration landscape, we need to take a closer look at the demographics of it. Um, we're talking a lot about, of course, diversity, and we've, he we've heard uh, Lucy's excellent speech about the three E's, and uh, amongst which is importantly, is equality and leveling the playing field, and diversity features a lot in our presentations and speeches. So I thought it is important to take a look at the demographics because it does inform uh, where we're going and is telling of the reality we have. Now, when we look at these demographics, there are a number of generations that I think feature. I have uh, noted no less than, we're talking about five generations at play. So there is the silent generation those that are born between 1925 to 1945. Now the age bracket is 75 to 95. Um, and then there is the baby boomers generation, those born 1946 to 1964 with an age bracket. Uh, of, uh, with an age bracket of 56 to 74. And then generation X, those born 1965 to 79, age bracket 41 to 55, um, and then generation Y, the millennials, uh, born 1980 to 1994, the age bracket 26 to 40 years old, um, and then generation Z, those born 1997 to 2012, age bracket 8 to 25, um, and then the generation that we have not yet featured in our discussions, generation Alpha, which is uh, 2013 up to 2025. These are the babies now, one to seven years old so far. And when I look at these demographics, it becomes instantly obvious to me that on the arbitrator's side, the baby boomers, the bracket, as we mentioned, 56 to 74, are presently leading on this front uh, for all good reasons, natural and otherwise, uh, but with some intake, uh, and increasingly so, well, decreasingly so, I have to say, from the silent generation. Uh, so the age bracket, 75 plus. So the baby boomers are at the forefront on the arbitrator's side. Uh, on the council and experts side, Generation X um, seems to be, which is the age bracket 40s to the early 50s, are presently leading on this front with some intake. Uh, from the baby boomers who still practice also as counsel. On the tribunal secretary side, Generation Y or the millennials, uh, 26 to 40, are leading on this front with minor intake from Generation X. On the institution side, leadership positions are currently maintained by the baby boomers with clear and increased intake from Generation X in terms of senior management, case managers across different institutions are currently taking the lead on this front with more or less an increased intake because of the recognition of diversity and bringing new blood, Generation Y as well, uh, taking some more uh, roles to play on the senior side. So the millennials there. Uh, and then Generation Z, uh, these are the frontline newcomers into the professional world. Um, and they obviously, uh, with an increased, increased access, familiarity, and use of technology and potentially artificial intelligence. And then Generation Alpha, who have not yet entered, and be, it will be some years before they do so, but at the time they enter, artificial intelligence at the time will be a given and it will be integrated. And our process, the services, the two parts that I said I'm not going to speak on will have by then changed completely. Um, and at that time, things will look, people will look back and will look at what we're discussing today uh, in terms of remote virtual hearings, the technology we have, and they will look with a smile about how obsolete and primitive this is uh, or has been. Now, in the next 10 years, generations X, Y, and Z will converge on the workplace and on the international arbitration uh, scene or arena. And this brings me to a survey conducted by INSEED, Emerging Markets Institute, Universum, and the Head Foundation. 
where they surveyed 18,000 professionals and students across these three generations. So we're talking about age brackets, uh, 40 up to the very young ones, generation Y uh, uh, below 20. Um, and the idea was in this survey across these uh, uh, 18,000 professionals from these generations, the three X, Y, and Z from 19 countries, they found some important differences in their aspirations and values. And I'm interested in one aspect of it in relation to the role of technology. And so when asked members of these three generations, X, which I belong to, the 40s one, uh, when asked which technologies are likely to rev revolutionize work in the coming decade, Generation Z, so the youngest, the very you know, young in their 20s, uh, were most enthusiastic about the potential use of virtual reality, which from our perspective is mostly connected to gaming. But the reality is uh, this will indeed find its way into practice and professional applications. Generation Y, who are in their late uh, uh, 20s and more uh, on the 30s, uh, so virtual reality as a technology most likely to revolutionize their work in the coming decade, putting it ahead of wearable technology, project management, and audio video conferencing, the reality we're seeing now. Generation X, on the other hand, those in their uh, late 40s or in their 40s and uh, mid 50s, um, felt that virtual reality would have a low impact on their work speaking from the present, they are most enthusiastic about project management tools where certain countries, people professionals from certain countries like Germany, Japan, and Russia expressed excitement about cloud computing and e-learning tools. More than 70% of the respondents across all three generations said flexible working arrangements represent an important opportunity for their work lives in the next 10 years. So even though they may have had different views about the role of technology, about the transformative role applications may have, across all generations, flexible working arrangements manifested itself as both a reality and an opportunity. And this just brings me to my essential question, how can this inform choices and open opportunities in the international arbitration world? And here are my four takeaways before I conclude. There will be a rise in e-council, as I call it, and I don't mean e-council as in artificial intelligence, but I'm saying individuals working remotely uh, in a more of a remote virtual environment. And this comes as a package with potentially e-hiring and remote working. So the barriers to work permits, perhaps, to uh, not seeing much, uh, 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 let's say, prospect in hiring people unless they are physically present in the jurisdiction that you're practicing uh, is gradually withering away and fainting. And there is more opportunity, there are more opportunities to hire people from distant localities, different parts from the globe, even though they may not be physically present within the same jurisdiction, they will be working with people or partners in this area. So this is an area of opportunity that requires us to carefully reflect on. Then there will be the indispensability of tech savvy practitioners. Technology no longer is a luxury. Access to this and use of tools uh, in our field, international arbitration, uh, is becoming increasingly indispensable. It is also going to inform choices of both counsel and arbitrators uh, more so than ever. And then my third point, open access to information, e-visibility, as I call it, on the global virtual platform. So we're going, and we are actually seeing, with the proliferation of online conferences, webinars, and the low value or even the free access to this, unlike our normal physical conference gathering, which are very high cost, you need to travel, and in order to get or you know to register, you need to pay an amount, which was to an extent prohibitive uh, for the younger generation, uh, specifically Y and Z. Um, so this open access with the World Wide Web uh, globally 
we're able to have people from many distant localities across the globe joining webinars, conferences, having access to information, interacting, uh, more e-visibility than ever. And I think this is going to continue because even post-COVID, all events that are currently being organized do factor, of course, the potential or possible physical presence, but with the possibility of virtual uh, uh, interaction and virtual registrations and virtual platforms being used for those who cannot come physically. And then my fourth point is the new blood transfusion, I call it, uh, into the practice of international arbitration, where the absence of territorial barriers uh, and regression in the overrated emphasis on physical mobility um, as exposed by COVID-19 uh, has created and led to a more cosmopolitan and diverse international arbitration community with more diverse factions uh, brought on board, be it gender, of course, which is at the forefront of all discussions, but more so ethnic minorities becoming more visible and practitioners from many countries uh, in Africa, Latin America, Asia, many other places, uh, but mostly so becoming more visible. And here again, further opportunities to bring in new blood, which I call the transfusion into the system, and more so people with physical disabilities and mobility restraints. When you think of council and arbitrators, uh, it was not an easy decision to go and, and, and consider people that have restraints on their mobility uh, or a degree of disability. But now with COVID-19, this has been tested and you see that those who possess all what is needed in terms of stamina and intellect cannot be denied the opportunity nor the ability uh, to participate effectively in arbitration proceedings and be considered for different roles, be it counsel or arbitrator work and do things remotely uh, as efficient and as proper as you would expect from others. So I think this is transformative in relation to not just ethnic and gender, but those with special needs and those with mobility restraints. And to conclude, I also give you four comments. COVID-19 has indeed brought about these opportunities and prospects amongst the players uh, in as much as the services and the process itself is being transformed. And if we look beyond the visible negative implications, the silver lining, which is getting, by the way, broader rather than thinner, is that more opportunities are created for cross-generational interaction. We see this constantly now in events where we see from the baby boomers, generation X, Y, and Z uh, in events, in uh, discussions across the board, which leads and will lead to a more inclusive global arbitration community. And this dialogue, cross-generational dialogue, uh, will no doubt benefit the practice of arbitration, both in terms of the process, the service, and the players as well. In a 2019 global survey released by the Workplace Institute at Cronus and Future Workplace, 3,400 respondents from Generation Z. So this was a survey only for Generation Z, the incoming generation into the practice, were asked general questions uh, and their thoughts on the economy, workplace readiness, expectations, corporate culture, learning, uh, and developing their careers across 12 jurisdictions, Australia, New Zealand, Belgium, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Mexico, the Netherlands, the UK, and the US. And quite interestingly, 32% of this Generation Z, the very, the youngsters, as I would say, uh, said that they are the hardest working generation ever. 36% believe that they had it the hardest when entering uh, the working world compared to other generations. And this may come as striking to many, especially from the older generation. But when you look at it, uh, well, of course, the supply is much available now and is abundant beyond the, beyond the demand. There are too many young qualified, and, and Lucy has mentioned, how many uh, degrees you may have, languages to speak, trainings, whatever, to be able to make it and compete with others from across the globe. Because previously with the past generations, you would compete with your peers in certain jurisdictions and then you make it regionally and then internationally. Whereas now these barriers between the domestic, the regional 
and the internationals are, the international are being blurred and are disappearing because of the use or, and the open access to the global community online. Uh, so this does explain the hard work that this generation needs to put into effect. And the third takeaway or conclusion is that there is a rise, uh, there is the risk and promise of the regionalization of international arbitration. The practical reality is that we see now sometimes time zones are barriers to having hearings stretched over a limited number of days because people may be in the US or Australia and Singapore and the arbitrators in Europe or otherwise. And so the hearing days are limited to an extent. And so this is leading gradually to considering appointments of both council and arbitrators to narrow down the impact of time zones. And this creates both a promise for regionalization, but a risk, because when we talk about a truly cosmopolitan, all-inclusive international arbitration practice, uh, we should, to a very large extent, ensure that we're not nationalizing or regionalizing international arbitration. And I was thrilled to see that uh, Professor Rogers is going to address uh, uh, regionalization. I, I, I do not in, uh, 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 present that I know what, what she's going to present on, but it's, it's a very interesting topic, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what she has to say in this regard, especially with more interregional trade relations, institutions administering regional arbitrations in a way. And my final point with which I will end is that what I would say is the inevitable winds of change are definitely and always powered by the sands of time. Um, and so for the new generations of be it Y or Z, time is on their side and they just need to uh, use it wisely, patiently to build substantively their skills so that when the time comes, they'll be able to take, of course, the helm and participate effectively in an all-inclusive arbitration environment, be it in the role as counsel, expert, secretary to tribunals or arbitrators. Uh, on this note, I end by saying that there is a lot uh, uh, to be said about COVID-19, but on the prospects and uh, uh, opportunities, uh, the doors are wide open and it's up for us to see that moment and make the most out of it for a better future and a glistening path for international arbitration. Thank you very much.